My name is Rex Jones and owner of uh, AMP Management Company here in Austin, Texas, and we manage about 3,000 units here that all have a affordable component to them. And we're privileged and honored to be a small part of this as a sponsor, but want to, again, tip our hat to Mike and Nora and their team because they do all the hard work making a difference in Austin by their resources, their team, and actually use their time and energy and have boots on the ground making a difference in affordability in Austin, Texas. I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Richard Reeves. Richard is a senior fellow in economic studies, director of the Future of Middle Class Initiative and co-director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. His research focuses on the middle class, inequality, and social mobility. Mr. Reeves' publications for the Brookings Institute include his latest book, Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, and Why is That a Problem, and What Can We Do About It? He is also a member of the Government of Canada's Ministerial Advisory Committee on Poverty, and also teaches at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. In September 2017, Political, mag Politico magazine named Mr. Reeves one of the top 50 thinkers in the, in the United States for his work on class and inequality. And as he takes us now into our, uh, his keynote address, I invite you to watch a short video here of where Mr. Reeves tackles the questions, is America dreaming, understanding social mobility? Thank you. We're going to talk about inequality and opportunity in America. Let's start by dividing the population up into five equally sized slices. If you're boring like me, you might call them quintiles. In an absolutely equal society where everybody had the same amount of money, each fifth of the distribution would get a fifth of the money. It would look like this. Of course, that's not how it is. In the real world, the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth, gets 5% of the money, and the top fifth get more than half the money. But I think in terms of fairness, and certainly in terms of American fairness, the question's less what's the gap between the bottom and the top, and it's more what are your chances of making it from the bottom to the top? How mobile is society? How far does where you're born on the ladder affect where you end up on the ladder? So in a, a perfectly mobile society, uh, an opportunity utopia, being born down here in the bottom quintile would have no effect on where you ended up. You'd be equally likely to make it to the top as to stay at the bottom. But now I want to show you what it's really like. Right now, for the people born at the bottom, more than one in three of them will remain stuck at the bottom, and just one in ten are going to make it all the way up to the top. That's bad enough, but it's, it's even worse for certain groups in the population. If you were born in the bottom quintile and you're a black American, you have a 50% chance of remaining stuck at the bottom and just a 3% chance of making it Horatio Alger style all the way to the top. So this is the picture for black America. For white Americans, the picture looks close to that utopia with roughly the same chances of making it to the top of the distribution as of being stuck at the bottom those who are born at the bottom and are raised by parents who are never married. And for that group, the odds of making it to the top are pretty slim as well. For them, it looks like this. For those raised by married parents, it looks like this. Again, it's pretty close to what you might hope for in a perfectly mobile society. Those who are born at the bottom, if they're raised by married parents, have a pretty good chance of making it to the top. So, if you don't complete high school, there's a 50% chance you're going to stay stuck at the bottom, if you were born at the bottom, and a 1% chance that you're going to make it to the top 20% of the income distribution as an adult yourself. So for them, it looks like this. If you're born at the bottom, born in this bottom fifth, but you're one of the few born down here who managed to get a four-year college degree, transforms your chances of moving up the income distribution. Go to college. 
we can have a long argument about the gap between the rich and the poor, but I think we can all agree that we don't want to live in a society where where you're born determines so strongly your chances in life or where you end up. America has a dream of equal opportunity, and we're a very long way right now from that dream. We have a big problem, and we need big solutions. Thank you, Thank you. There are few things more embarrassing than watching myself <laughs> do that Lego video. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, I'm Richard Reeves, you just saw me. <laughs> <laughs> playing with Lego. <laughs> um, we did that. I wrote an essay, I think it's four years ago now, uh, at Brookings, and we decided we wanted to try and project the main ideas <clears throat> of mobility. So this guy came to me from Brookings and said, oh, let's, let's do Lego. I was like, really? All right, fine. Um, and so we shot that in about 20 minutes, I think. I uh, had no idea that this many years later I'd be forced to watch myself doing it all over again. Um, but it did do really well, um, and I think one of the reasons it did really well is because it just kind of simplifies uh, what's a very complex subject, and I'm about to make that subject much more complex now, which is this whole idea of the extent to which where you're born or which rung of the ladder you're born on affects where you end up. And I'm now deliberately using the word where, because since that video was made, and there are lots of simplicities in it that I can talk about, um, there's been subsequent research shows that, as well as race, which I've already talked about, family structure, um, and education, we have learned a lot more about place and how important place is um, for upward mobility. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that to, to, towards the end of my time. But first of all, I want to add my thanks to, to the Fed and to Housing Works and to all of those who've been involved in uh, organizing this. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, uh, and it's made m my life much easier to have such professional people uh, working. So thank you for that. And thank you to Rex for mentioning in the course of his introduction that Politico magazine did name me one of the top 50 thinkers in the US. Now, that's an annual survey that they do, and I have to say that in previous years I've thought it was a completely stupid survey. <laughs> completely subjective, clickbait nonsense. But that year, I think you'll agree with me, it was just really nailed it. <laughs> really, really, just that one year. Um, I have a, a couple of apologies to make as, uh, as well. The first is that I'm going to use lots of charts. Um, but I, I get the sense already that you're an audience that likes charts, right? You like data. I've seen the, the, the handout. There's lots of charts in that handout. Um, and I'm a Brookings Senior Fellow. Uh, and frankly, we don't go anywhere without charts. We have an anxiety attack if we don't have a PowerPoint presentation with charts. Uh, I use charts to answer the question, how was your day, darling? <laughs> I'm like, well, mean, median, do you want the standard error? I mean, it's great in my, in my house. And the second apology is, in case you haven't already noticed, I am not from Austin, <laughs> or indeed from Texas, or indeed from the US. And so I'm going to lecture you about the American class system. And I'm going to do it in this accent. <laughs> Get over it. Here's my defense. Number one, where I come from, in case you haven't already guessed, I'm from the UK originally. We know a lot about class. Right? I know a class system when I see it. I was raised in one. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and number two is that although I sound like this now, I'm actually a US citizen. I became a US citizen in 2016. I was, in fact, uh, one of the last group to, be, uh, to take the oath of allegiance on the very last day in my home state of Maryland that you could register to vote in the state of Maryland. So it was in the last group, 53 people from 47 different countries um, at the end of the day, and we, every single one of us went straight from taking our oath to sign it to registering to vote at the Women's League. Um, uh, and so I was one of those last 53 to vote. So I voted in the US presidential election, which, I was, which is why I wanted to get it done that day, so that I could immediately register to vote on that last day. Also because I still have a British passport, I managed to vote in the Brexit referendum uh, by mail. So it was a banner year for me. <laughs> I had a French friend texting me, don't take French citizenship. <laughs> I didn't, and Macron won. See, it may, may, not, be it may not be causation. Um, actually, hands up who's been to a citizenship ceremony, participated in one, or attended one. Hands up who's been to one. Okay, that's a, fa a fair number. 
Um, I hope you'll agree with me that they're quite moving experiences. It was a big deal for me um, to become a US citizen, but my God, by comparison to the one from Afghanistan with the, with the child in her arms next to me, by comparison to the family from Mexico, by comparison to the people from Vietnam, by comparison to people from Sudan, from Iraq, that's a really big deal. And my modest policy proposal, which I put out a couple of months ago, is that every US high schooler should attend a citizenship ceremony as part of their civics education. Why not? It's, it's doable, there's some practicality. Why, why not? Because actually if you're raised here, if you don't go through that kind of process, you don't understand how an incredibly patriotic moment it is, how incredibly proud everyone is. And it might just change a little bit the way we think about immigrants. Because actually quite a few of the people on that Politico list, which is a great list in case I haven't mentioned it, but also people are, are immigrants, including myself. I'm, I'm very proud to be American. I'm also very proud to be an immigrant. But part of my journey from the UK, which is this, as you know, very class-bound society, to the US has been a journey of comparing the two, the two systems. And I'll cut to the chase. I have lots of charts to support what I'm about to say. But the, the, the bottom line is this. I have come reluctantly to the conclusion that the American class system works more ruthlessly and more effectively than the British one I left behind. The US class system is more efficient, more ruthless. And the reason you might not think that that's true is because it does so in the US under this veneer of meritocracy, camouflaged by the idea of a classless society. There's one good reason why, why we don't talk as much about class in the US, and that's because racial inequality, the original sin of the founding, is so salient and remains such an important divide. But the bad reason we don't talk, that's the good reason we don't talk about class, the bad reason is because we continue to believe that we live in a classless society. And guess, guess who are the people who are most likely to believe in meritocracy or a classless society? People who are doing well. The successful. They're the ones who really believe in meritocracy. Um, because it's very, very much easier to convince ourselves that the reason we're successful is because of our own brilliance and our own hard work. Much more uncomfortable to think that part of our success might be structures, systems, luck. Um, as someone uh, pointed out to me, and I use this in a piece I wrote for the Times, at least in the UK, the posh people have the decency to feel guilty. I used to hate that. <laughs> I used to hate the kind of guilt and the kind of class and all that stuff. Now I think, well, at least you can do something with guilt. Guilt signals awareness. At least we know in the UK. And maybe that's not the right way about it, but at least with some guilt. I have been astonished by how guilt-free successful life in America can be. And of the systems and structures that perpetuate inequality and that drive this growing class divide in the US, the housing market is one of the main culprits. The housing market is one of the main ingredients of this brutally effective class perpetuation machine that you're running in the US and I'm now part of. Right, so now for some charts. But I'll tell you a story first, actually. Where's the clicker? Is it on the thing? Right. Um, so I started to, uh, to think about this and write, uh, write my book, Dream Hoarders in 2015, I guess, when, um, and I've tried to make my title a bit more upbeat. You know, it was just everyone's screwed, but now it's like, let's try and share, hoarding or sharing, housing and the American dream. We don't have to hoard the American dream, we can share it, but one of the ways we have to do that is by sharing our communities, housing, land. But I started up because Barack Obama put out an idea in his tax uh, reform proposal in 2015, and the story of how this unfolded is what motivated me partly to write the book. So it's 2015. Oh, by the way, there's a few young people. I see there's a few young people in the audience. This is Barack Obama. <laughs> Feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? <laughs> Seriously, there's like human years, dog years, and Trump years. <laughs> it's like it's been forever. Seriously, how long ago was this? Anyway, he used to be president. Um, and I'm going to tell a story about how he didn't do so well on one particular issue. He's flying on Air Force One. He's just put out his tax proposals a couple of weeks before. Um, uh, he's flying from India to Saudi Arabia as part of a, a, a trade trip. Um, and Nancy Pelosi uh, is actually with him. And Nancy Pelosi gets a phone call. Nancy Pelosi gets a phone call from this man, Chris Van Hollen. 
at the time my congressman, now the junior senator for Maryland. And um, Chris has got on the phone to Nancy and he says, uh, this tax idea from the president is terrible. My email inbox is blowing up. Everyone hates it. You've got to talk to him. She says, well, I'm, I'm on Air Force One. I'm with the president. I'll just go and talk to him. So she goes along to his office. There's a knock at his door. By the way, I wasn't there. This is like in Hollywood, you know, based on real events. <laughs> But it's been pretty well reported. Hey, there's a knock at the, knock at the door. So let's try and make this real. Hey, come in. Who is it? Hi, it's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> How are you? What's up? Well, it's this tax proposal. It's terrible. I just got the phone to Chris. You've got to kill it. OK, I'll think about it. I'll talk to my senior advisors. <laughs> uh, next, uh, goes back to his office on Air Force One, calls the White House and says, hello, White House. It's the president. Kill the idea. Again, based on real events. Uh, so the key idea was killed the very next day. Uh, the idea was killed. This is not a video, it's a still. Uh, and they killed something which was going to reform college savings accounts, 529 college savings accounts. Hands up who knows what a 529 college savings account is. Yes. <laughs> um, and the 529 college savings accounts, for those who don't know, is just a tax advantage way to save for your kid's college. It's free of capital gains tax. It mostly avoids gift taxes. In most states, you also get an income tax deduction. So in Maryland, where I live, two kids, my wife and I can save $10,000 a year, save that off our Maryland income tax. Very nice. Thank you. Um, when we take it out, capital gains is not paid on it. The Obamas themselves put a quarter of a million in one year for their daughters and didn't pay any gift tax on it. So it's a very, very tax advantage way for people to save. Um, it was a Bush era tax cut. Clinton vetoed it when it hit, hit, when it hit his desk when he was a president. It passed. Um, and it is regressive. This shows you from the left to the right the poorest quarter, quartile, not quintiles now. If someone could sort out the quartile quintile thing in the US, that would be helpful for my work. This is quartiles. Um, and this shows you the dark blue bar tells me of the poorest quartile. Uh, quartile up to the richest, how many people have one of these 529 accounts? This is all households. And then of those who have one, conditional on having one, what's the average balance? Is the blue, is the light blue on the right. So as you'd expect, <laughs> uh, it goes predominantly to people in the top. And, the, and you can go into the top 10%, 1%, et cetera. It is perhaps the most regressive element in the tax cut. This is obvious, obviously going to happen. Um, you don't pay capital gains tax until you hit, hit a decent, pretty high income anyway. Um, in order to save money for your kids' college education, you need uh, money. Um, it's a long way away, et cetera. And, and then the, you add it insult to injury through the state deductions, right? It's, it's, it's horrible. Um, and so Obama said, well, let's stop doing this. Let's, you know, let's stop now. We won't penalize, penalize people going back, and we'll put it into the opportunity tax credit instead, which would be much more uh, progressive. All hell broke loose. And it didn't just break loose in the Republican Party, it broke, lo it broke loose among Chris Van Hollen and Nancy Pelosi. Uh, this is the median income for the counties that are roughly coterminous with the uh, places that they represent Van, uh, Pelosi, Van Hollen, and then the national median. These are affluent districts, highly educated districts I should know, I live in one, and everyone lost it. You're going to take away my college savings account? Well, yes, because look, it's a colossal waste of money doesn't actually increase savings, and all of the benefit goes to people at the top. Um, uh, and this is what, why Paul Waldman put it very well. What happened to this, this um, idea was that it was targeted, this 529 reform, at the single most dangerous constituency to anger, the upper middle class. Wealthy enough to have influence and numerous enough to be a significant voting bloc. I was like, ah, these people really know how to take care of themselves. President Obama, in the process, became the first president in living memory to ask his own party to vote against his own tax proposal before it even got to Congress. 529 college savings account, under pressure from his own party. And I thought, wow, these people are entitled. They, they feel entitled to these tax breaks. They think they're barely scraping by. They think they're just hardworking, ordinary Americans. Wow, what's happened? And they said, no, 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 I'm struggling. It's the top 1% that's the problem. It's the plutocrats. So, okay, right, I need to write a book. Because <laughs> that's what you do at Brookings. <laughs> Faced with this horrific social problem, you write a book. Now, hands up who's heard of this idea that it's the top 1%. We are the 99%. Hands up who's heard that framing of inequality. Um, actually, uh, that was the framing that's mostly been here. And this, I can update this now. The trends are the same. 
Um, the top one, in fact, there's a very good piece from David Leonhardt in the Times like a week ago, which does something similar. The basic point here is if you look at what's happening to real, average real household income within these different groups, the top 1% are just galloping away from the rest. So this chart shows you what's happened to real incomes. Top 1%, 19% below them, which is the line just below. Where's the pointer? Yeah, you go. So there you go. That's an, so that's the top 1%. That's the 19% below. And then the 40% below them, and then the 40% below them. Thank you. Um, so that's the whole population. And look. So I, as it happens, I'm down here, right? So right now, to get into the top 1%, you need about a household income well into the 400s, depending on how you equivalize and household size, 450,000, say. Um, to get into the top 20% now, you probably need a household income of about 150,000, well into, well into six figures. That's the bottom. And the median income of the top 20% is uh, north of 200,000. Uh, a year. So that's, I'm just giving you those numbers, we can argue about them, but to kind of give you a sense of who I'm talking about. So look, I'm in, that, I'm in the 19%, I'm not in the top 1%, but I'm in the 90%. Look at me. Look, I'm barely, I mean, I'm just like along here with everyone else, bumping along. It's these people up here who are the problem. And what I've discovered actually is the people who are here, the people who are down in this 19% compared to the 1%, these are the ones that are really angry. The upper middle class. They're really angry at the people who are even richer than them. Right, so those of us who are in the upper middle class doing pretty well, we're really angry about the top 1%. We're especially angry if we went to college with them. <laughs> and if they got worse grades than us, it just probably so annoying. Uh, class warfare tends to get most intense as you get towards the top, right? It's the rich who are at really angry at the really rich. Um, and so, okay, fair enough, look, the top one, I don't, I don't want to minimize that problem. But let's take the top 1% out, okay? And just say bottom 40, oh, sorry, bottom 40, next 40, uh, and then the 19% above them. I've just taken the 1% out altogether. The first thing you'll notice is the left-hand axis has changed. Because the whole thing is, that in order to get the top 1% on the chart, Leonhardt does the same thing in the Times, I have to go up to 2 million here. I only have to go up to 200,000 here. Social scientists do their dirty work in various places. Their footnotes, their choice of inflation measure, and their left-hand axis. And so if you stretch the left-hand axis high enough, then it can make you look, look as if we're all just bumping on. So I've, I've taken the 1% out. Now, it's not as dramatic a chart because there's 19 times as many people in the 19%, which I'm showing here, as there are in the top 1%. But this is the inequality I'm focused on. There has been no increase in income inequality in the bottom 80% of the U.S. distribution. All the actions above that line, and it includes the 19%. They're pulling away. And this is just income. It's not just income. You can see, I won't show you all these charts, but you can see a similar trend of college-educated Americans, by and large, those in the top 20% of the distribution, pulling away in terms of family structure, in terms of their health. You see this growing health divide. Life expectancy is continuing to grow at the top quite quickly. It's now falling at the bottom. Um, culture and social capital, these the neighborhoods they live in. Uh, neighborhood segregation is increasing, so although racial segregation is dropping s somewhat in the U.S. from a very high base, of course, economic segregation of our neighborhoods is increasing. So to put it very bluntly, I'm slightly more likely in my upper middle class neighborhood to have a black neighbor, but I'm much less likely to have a working class neighbor. Right? I do have a black neighbor, but she's, she's, and she's a lawyer. And that's kind of, you know, just a, a, absolutely a good uh, vignette. Wealth inequality is growing, and housing. Housing, which drives so much, and I'm going to come to that at the end. Um, so I've already shown the video, this is a sense of kind of sticky ends, people moving up, people being stuck at the top, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So I'm going to show you this chart, though. I work a little bit with Raj Chetty's team, who run Opportunity Insights out of Harvard. They're using anonymized tax records to do the very best work on social mobility in the U.S. and possibly the world now. What this shows you is the percentage of people who are economically better off than their parents at the same age, based on their birth year. So if you're born in 1940, you had a roughly 90% chance of overtaking your parents, being better off than your parents. For those born in 1980, it's 50%. Why? Two reasons. Lower growth. You know, it's much easier when the economy is growing. The U.S. economy grew at 4% a year between 1950 and 1973. Wow, okay. That's, that's a big upward boost. Um, and even more importantly, inequality. Uh, the distribution of the proceeds of economic growth were much more equitable during those years. As a result of both those trends, lower growth and higher inequality, we see a drop, so it's now a coin toss, whether or not you'll actually surpass your parents. Now, what's the relationship between that sense of absolute mobility, which is, am I better off than my parents, and relative mobility, which is what I showed you with the Lego 
which is a zero-sum game, right? For some to go up, some have to come down. That's the thing about relative mobility. You can only get 20% of the population in the top quintile. I'm not an economist, actually, by background, but I do know that for sure. Uh, and so it means if you want to get more poor people going into the top 20%, guess what? Some of the rich people have to fall out. No one's in favor of that. Um, and I'm not in favor of it personally, but I am in favor of policies that encourage more movement both up and down. What actually happens is that we use various markets, including the housing market, the education market, to actually protect our own children against downward mobility. We put a glass floor underneath them so that even if they are of mediocre abilities, of course, none of our children have mediocre abilities, but just imagine that they did, uh, we, they still do pretty well because by the time they hit the labor market, they've had so many opportunities. Um, but the relationship between the two, this sort of sense of being b better off than your parents, economic growth, and relative mobility is moving up and down. It's a bit like driving on a road where everyone's driving along at 50 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour or whatever, and someone overtakes you. You're driving along, someone overtakes you, and you're all getting there. You're in this situation. You don't mind, do you? I mean, if you do, you've got bigger problems. But as a general principle, right, if you're one of those people that just has to win, you, you might not like it. But generally, oh, okay, it's fine. You know? And that's a bit like actually dropping a quintile in an economy that's doing really well and that's pretty equitable. Ah, we're all getting there, right? But if there's much lower growth, then it's more like this. The stakes are higher. You really don't like it when a person cuts in, do you? You've been waiting. And so as inequality grows and as growth slows, the stakes around relative mobility get higher. And we get more strongly incentivized to use every tool at our disposal to make sure we stay ahead. And one of those tools is housing. I'm just going to briefly talk about this book, because this is, this is from 1958. There's a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy by a British sociologist called Michael Young. Almost didn't get this book published. And he really worried about the book. And he worried about it because he came up with this, this word. He invented this word, meritocracy. And he said, oh, no one's going to take it seriously because it, it globs together a word with a Latin root and a word with a Greek root. Seriously, this is the stuff that British academics worried about in the 1950s. As it turns out, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that people took the word and used it in exactly the opposite way to the way Young intended. This is a dystopia. He wrote it as a novel. It's a dystopia. In it, he describes a society that comes to believe itself to be a meritocracy, where talent and I IQ and effort are what determine the outcomes. Not an aristocracy but a true meritocracy of talent. He describes it's worth a read, this book. Four things happen. One, inequality massively increases. Because in a meritocracy, if you're doing well, it can only be because of your own, as I said, your own brilliance and hard work. So woe betide the person that tries to tax me, take my money away, and give it to other people. So in, it justifies inequality. Meritocracy justifies inequality. Secondly, growing despair and disillusionment among the people who are not flourishing. Because guess what? It's really hard to not be doing well in a society that tells you it's a meritocracy. Because after all, it can only be your fault. Third thing that happens is that people become obsessed with who they marry and have children with. Because in a meritocracy, you want super clever children. Uh, and so people actually start to really do what sociologists call assortative mating. It's a very unromantic term. Don't use it on your dating profile. But assortative mating just means marrying someone like you, and it's increasing. You marry someone who has similar levels of education to you, etc. And so people double down, and so college graduates now pretty much marry college graduates. That's two college graduate incomes. Um, and so you see this rise in this inequality. Thank you. Um, and then the fourth thing that happens in his book is that the people who are left behind in this meritocracy become so angry that a bloody revolution, in, guided by a skillful populist leader, takes place. Not bad, 1958. Where do we go to college? Well, I'm going to skip through some of these now to get to housing. It depends where you come from. <laughs> um, I'm just going to show that like, the bottom 40%, middle 40%, and top 20% have very, very different education. This is conditional on going to college. The middle 40% are going to two-year institutions and four-year and, and public access four years. So the debate about higher education in the U.S. is almost entirely about the top 20% selected four years. That's, the only, that's where the top quintile kids go. It's not where other people, by and large, go, but the media are obsessed with it. Why? Because that's where they went, or it's where their kids are going. There are now almost no members of Congress who don't have a four-year college degree. 
And the last time there was a serious debate about community colleges in Congress, well, no one can remember. We were assessed with four years. I'm going to skip this. This just shows you, by quintile, where students come from for different institutions. Just, this is Chetty's work. Harvard's on there for fun. All this just shows you is that these elite institutions that we're so concerned about are just entirely upper middle class. Um, but the work of educating middle class kids and lower income kids is being done in community colleges and public four years. That's where the work is being done. And for what it's worth, people working in community colleges, in my view, are doing God's work. And they're neglected. If there's an infrastructure bill out of Congress, I hope that it includes a lot of money to rebuild community colleges. I'm going to skip Bernard Williams' Warrior Society just in the interest of time and talk about opportunity hoarding and now get to the housing part. In my book, I'm going to I talk about this idea of opportunity hoarding. Opportunity hoarding is the way in which we not only prepare our kids better for the market, make sure they're skilled, etc., but that we basically cheat our way to inequality. We rig the market in our favor. And the three examples I use are exclusionary zoning, legacy admissions, and internships. Of the three, zoning and housing generally is easily the biggest issue. And if I was writing the book again, I might even just write the book about that. Um, I'll we'll touch briefly on the others. But you know all this. this, is a, this is, I'm well aware that I'm in an audience that knows much more about this than I do. You'll have seen this chart. It's a simple chart. It's rent, not housing. But we know that housing's getting real expensive. <laughs> Um, uh, certainly compared to incomes. Um, why is that? Well, maybe it's because of this. This is um, Shoag, uh, Ganong and Shoag's work. It's an innovative way to try and measure what's happening to land use regulation over time. And what they do is look at court cases and see how many court cases include some sort of land use regulation over time. Obviously, a lot of these were racially motivated um, and racially codified, but even, even after the absence of explicitly racist uh, zoning regulations, they remain classist in their effect and therefore racist very often in their results. Um, but basically what's happening is they're kind of regulating land a lot more. The US is becoming much smaller, economically speaking. Economic activity is unfortunately more concentrated in certain places. We're seeing a big rise in geographical economic inequality. And what that means is that land and housing in the areas that are doing well has become more scarce. And so it's become more of a zero-sum game. Um, and so there's pressure on those housing markets uh, and zoning regulations, exclusionary zoning regulations, lack of density. I'm so pleased that we're talking about density today. Um, means that land gets expensive. It's hard for people to move in, etc. And I'll just say that actually in terms of class, that's a big problem. And this is the last chart on housing. And this is from a PhD uh, thesis actually from uh, Morrow, the Council for Economic Advisors, quoted in um, 16. And just one example. Um, this is Los Angeles. And this is telling, telling you what happens to the Los Angeles housing market over time. So you've got 1960. The black line is, oh, I'm sorry. The black line is uh, how, much, how many people it's zoned for. Los Angeles. And the red line is how many people actually live there over time. And so in 1960, Los Angeles was zoned for roughly 10 million people. 2.5 million people live there, so there's a big gap. And then over time, um, the, the lines close. And so what's happened is that as the population of Los Angeles has grown, the zoning has shrunk to fit it. Neighborhood zoning, density zoning, single family zoning, all at a local level. Um, and so now, uh, Los Angeles is zoned for about the number of people that live there. Well, we were right in 1960. There's enough room. It's just that the zoning means that we can't get the people in there anymore. And this is just one city, of course. And you can tell the, uh, the same story elsewhere. The reason it's important for this opportunity hoarding is not simply because it has this economic effect, which makes it harder for people to move, makes it harder for people to live, and it makes housing expensive, right? Land is scarce. You control it um, through zoning. Um, is that those of us on the right side of this do very well out of this housing market in the short run, right? Um, I'm not saying, let's imagine a system whereby you said, okay, let's do your school admissions on a geographical basis, which means you have to buy a house in the right area, all right? But that's expensive, so let's have a mortgage interest deduction to help me do that. So far, so good. But what happens if lots of poor people move in, changing the, the character of the neighborhood, et cetera? I know, we'll zone them out. 
So I'm not saying that some evil genius sat down and said, I know, let's do schools geographically, massively subsidize uh, expensive housing through mortgage interest deduction, and then zone people out as a brilliant way to sustain class position. I'm not saying an evil genius did that. I'm just saying that if an evil genius existed, they might do something like that. <laughs> uh, on the subject of tax deductions, the interest group I'm interested in, the top 20% on the right, middle 40, bottom 40. This is the value of tax deductions, and you can see mortgage interest in there. 70 billion a year? We got rid of mortgage interest in the UK. That's one thing we did do. It took a while. Um, so we subsidize uh, the ri rich people to buy expensive houses in areas that they then zone to protect their wealth and perpetuate class inequality and lock people out of opportunity. So land and housing. I was just reading John Locke recently, and Locke said, well, there's not a problem with land in America because there's so much room. Well, not anymore there isn't. Um, we have these wealth gaps that are growing, and I'm going to skip through some of these now. I'm just going to make the point, you've seen these charts before, I'm sure, but you should never forget when we're talking about wealth that um, housing is, housing and pensions, of course, are principal forms of wealth in the U.S., and this is the race gap. And the systematic exclusion of black Americans um, from uh, the housing market has resulted in a, a wealth gap that is not only wide, but widening over time. So where do we go from here? And I'm going to finish with this. Well, what I'm trying to do in my book is to make us feel a bit uncomfortable, to say, actually, we're part of the problem. It's not just the top 1%. It's us. Right? We are those of us who are on the right side, the upper middle class, the professionals, people running everything, part of the problem. Um, and the trouble is, though, that we never think that we're rich. So you see these surveys recently. People think the rich should pay more taxes. It's very topical right now because of Democrat proposals. Everyone says, yeah, the rich should pay more taxes. Always have to ask the second question. Are you rich? Because no one is. And all this chart does uh, is to show you that the more money you have, the more money you think you need to be rich. Right? So the people, who, uh, people who, are, who make at least 100K, which is well below my quintile, think you need 500,000 to be rich. So when, when these people are saying, yeah, 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 let's make the rich pay, they never mean themselves. Because we have convinced ourselves, those of us in the upper middle class, that it's the top 1%, 0-1%, the plutocrats, the people making millions, billions, etc., who are the problem. Rather than take responsibility for ourselves. When I was writing the book, I said you have to read Hofstadter, the historian. It's really worth rereading, actually, especially on the paranoid style in American politics. I read this on the Progressive Era. This is what Hofstadter said. The Progressive Era led to the high school movement, and the birth of some of the welfare systems we have in place now. This is what Hofstadter said. The moral indignation of the age, the Progressive Era, was by no means directed entirely against others. Now, it's moral indignation is always directed against others. It might be immigrants, or women, or people of color, or rich people, or whatever, but it's always someone else. It was, in great and critical measure, directed inward. Contemporaries who spoke of it as an affair of the conscience were not mistaken. If Hofstad is right, then one of the things that led to the progressive era, and we need a new progressive era, wasn't just finding who else to blame for inequality. It was taking responsibility for ourselves. It was saying that we are part of the problem. And what tends to happen is that we don't like that idea. And what really tends to happen, particularly among those who are on the liberal left side in the US, is that they subcontract their liberalism to distant occasional votes. But it happens, to quote, Ger Gerald C Jerry Cohen wrote a book called If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich? Great book. And he said, actually, social justice is not just to be found in systems and structures. It is to be found in the thick of our daily lives. In the thick of our daily lives. And the thick of our daily lives includes the neighborhoods that we live in and the local regulations that dominate them, the schools that we send our children to, and the admissions policies that they have, the institutions that we run, and the way we hire and promote and bring in internships. And so, yes, there are all these things we have to do, but let's start where we are. Let's stand in our own shoes as leaders of institutions, as members of neighborhoods, and actually, rather than hoard the American dream behind the doors of our institutions and the gated communities that we gate through zoning, Rather than hoarding those opportunities, let's give a little bit, sacrifice a little bit, and start sharing the American dream, which was, after all, the whole point of America. Thank you for your attention. OK. Questions? Do you want me to do the questions on the... F Thank you. Do you want me to do the questions on the funny thing? Or hands up. How do you want to do the questions? I'm sure I've been told, but... 
Hands? Yes, go on, shout it out. Demand is always yeah. more elastic than supply, yes. especially in the housing market. Yep. How do you efficiently fill those gaps, and, uh, or how do you build an equitable community by efficiently filling those gaps yeah. within a capitalist system? Okay, great. So um, the, uh, I'm thinking mostly about supply side, right? You're right, the demand's more elastic. Um, um, but when I think about the problems of the housing market, I see it in most places as more of a supply side than demand side problem. Um, people are moving less, but there doesn't seem to be a drop in appetite for moving particularly. 50% of Americans say they would move if they could. Uh, mobility has dropped, geographical mobility has dropped for those with lower skills, um, not so much for those with higher skills on the demand side. So there's a big difference in who's not moving. Um, so I tend, to, I tend to want to focus on the supply side and see what demand does. Um, and I should say that when I say we should loosen up supply, I don't necessarily mean you have to sort of just go you know, zoning free. Um, I'm very interested in the work around the missing middle in the US housing market. And do you know Parallax's work? There's an architect from California, Daniel, Daniel is it? But Parallax, anyway, is the name. He talks about the missing middle. And it shows quite convincingly that the US housing market is kind of, you know, almost bifurcated into sort of single family dwellings and then kind of. Um, uh, apartment buildings, and what's been lost is duplexes, triplexes, row houses, granny flats, etc. Um, and Parallax shows quite convincingly that you can significantly increase density without massively changing the physical characteristic of a neighborhood through those sorts of rooms. And so you can fill in there, and then you can kind of create more. But, but I, I, I'm, this is going to sound very crude, but I actually just think there's a massive supply side problem that can only be solved by doing something about density, opening up the supply side, and hoping that demand will follow. Uh, I think there's enough evidence that that will happen um, if we get the supply side right. So I think that's the main way the problem is we've got to get rid of the mortgage interest deduction. We've got to really go hard on zoning, um, kind of local zoning, especially exclusionary zoning, um, and, and loosen the supply side. Yep. Oh. Do I have to do anything for this funny thing to work? No? Oh. Specific solutions. Minneapolis. If you don't know about it, yes. <laughs> That's my one word answer. Uh, in fact, I'm doing a joint event with the Minneapolis Fed in October on housing and the middle class because the Minneapolis Comprehensive Plan um, is one of the most exciting things that's happened in this area. If you don't know about it, what it's basically doing is kind of solving a lot of these density issues and basically think the idea of kind of single family zoning. Um, specific cities, cities leverage. Yeah, um, Minneapolis. Um, it's just, uh, honestly, I think it's the politics. I don't think it's as much a policy problem, right? This is not my area of expertise. Jenny Schutz is my colleague in this. But actually, that's, you, know, you can do it. You can, you can do it. Um, it's just you can't do it. Uh, how do you get the politics to work? And I think I'm most interested about Minneapolis is how do they get the politics to work? It's when the Seattle mayor tried it, when Massachusetts tried it, when Wiener tried the, the, the bill in California. Uh, it's really hard because you run straight into this wall of upper middle class resistance. <laughs> Interestingly, the liberal cities politically are more tightly zoned than the conservative ones. So let's not tell ourselves that this is not an issue. Oh, well, it's conservatives that don't like this. It's liberals. To be really unfair, there are certain neighborhoods where, you know how you get these signs like, hate has no home here? Great, like them, have one myself. I, I'm thinking about creating other signs which say, but zoning does. Because you know, sometimes that's where the rubber hits the road, right? It's very easy to have the right opinions. It's very easy to vote the right way. But what about your housing board? What about your school board? Do you show up? Do you vote the right way? Because the nice thing is about the current situation is you don't have to do anything. The status quo is deeply exclusionary and deeply unfair. So you don't have to show up and be the right wing or a conservative jerk, keeping poor people out. You just have to do nothing and let the NIMBYs show up. No, it's amazing, right? So no increase the value of land hurting. Uh, um, is it true? No. Um, yes, in some places and at certain occasions, and that's why when you think about areas that are quotes gentrifying, you have to think about affordability. I actually don't like the way gentrification has become this dirty word. Um, you know how it's become one of these reflexive things? Oh yeah, but it's going to gentrify. Well, don't we want mixed neighbourhoods? And are we only going to get mixed neighborhoods by moving low-income people into higher-income areas? So if higher-income people move into a low-income area, that's gentrification, so we're against it. I don't think we can be knee-jerk against it. I think we have to just think, how do we do it in a smart way? 
How do we make sure that before it happens, we've embedded affordable housing, we've embedded inclusionary zoning before that happens? Because I want mixed communities. Um, and overall, if we relax zoning, um, it will uh, Im increase supply. And if supply and demand works, then it should have the uh, effect on prices that we expect. And that is, in fact, what happens when you look at different cities and you look over time. My colleague Jonathan Rothwell has shown that quite convincingly. What is something you do in the thick of our day? Sure. Okay. <sighs> Housing boards and school boards are the two most effective class perpetuation machines in the U.S. So yes, vote the right way, have the right opinions, but your school board and your housing board are where the rubber hits the road. And so turning up to those, I'm trying to get, I'll give you two really, because I've said it's the thick of daily life, so yes, my, where I am now, having a battle about zoning and development, um, I'm trying to get my school PTA to give 50% of its money away because para funding of schools has become a big issue um, through kind of PTA funding. Um, and some places it's really, the line between public and private is starting to blur and where I live, which is a very affluent neighbor, neighborhood, there's lots of PTA funding. Um, and the school can therefore buy a soccer pitch and, a, you know. We ran, didn't have enough money for laptops. The county didn't have enough money for laptops. And so the middle school PTA sent an email out to say, we're a bit short. The county didn't have enough money to get laptops. And within a week, they'd raise the money to make sure that the kids in my, the kids in my son's middle school had the laptops. The PTA just did it. Meanwhile, there are schools in DC that don't have a PTA. So I'm trying to get 50% of our PTA funding should go somewhere else. Some schools are already doing it, should do that. Um, and in our institutions. Uh, again, the, 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 I'm always aware that these sound trivial, but let's think about something as apparently innocuous as take your kids to work day. Take your sons and daughters to work day. Here's an idea. Don't. There's lots of reasons why you shouldn't. But here's the reason. Because it's a class perpetuation device. Upper middle class kids get to go to upper middle class workplaces and see what it's like to work in an upper middle class workplace. Kids from low income backgrounds, if their parents work, get to see their parents stacking shelves, if they're allowed to go at all. And they get to experience their parents' work. No one designed it that way. Originally it was take your daughters to work day for good gender equality reasons, then they added sons. So we don't do that at Brookings anymore. We have take someone else's kid to work day. We call it career day. They wouldn't let me call it that. Um, and so you're actually forbidden from bringing your own kid. The relief among scholars at Brookings <laughs> was palpable. <laughs> you mean I'm not allowed to bring them? Great. <laughs> um, so actually, what we do now is we have about 150 uh, students from DC uh, public schools coming um, there. We do it through a couple of nonprofits. So they're, um, they're kids. We know they're kids who are disadvantaged, low income. Most of their parents don't work. Two thirds African American, uh, one third Hispanic. Um, and we, then they have a day, and it's uh, great. Um, now, am I going to tell you that's changed those kids' lives? Have I got a randomized control trial of its effect? No. But it's something. I actually don't teach at Georgetown anymore. I just stopped doing that. Why am I teaching rich kids at Georgetown? Um, I've stopped doing that, and instead we've set up a new series. It's not public yet, but uh, there's going to be a Brookings UDC lecture series. The University of District Columbia is basically our local community college serving our local community. And every single colleague I've asked to speak at that from... Janet Yellen through John Al General John Allen, who led our force in Afghanistan, my new boss, have all said yes. That's how we should spend our discretionary time. So how do we spend our discretionary time? How do we vote in housing boards? How do we vote in school boards? Um, and what do we do in our own institutions? Are we opening up? How do we hire? In I didn't do interns um, and legacy preferences, because I know I can tell what kind of audience you are. You don't need me to tell you that legacy preferences are a, in college admissions are an embarrassing abomination. Do, do, do I need to tell you that? They're an embarrassing abomination. Um, or the, the way internships are handed out. So There's another thing we th really think hard about. 50% uh, of interns are unpaid. Uh, about the same number seem to be hired on an informal basis. Many professions now actually uh, really, really emphasize getting internship opportunities or another, uh, other work-based opportunities. So how those opportunities in your institutions are allocated really matters. If you do it as a favor for a friend, or you ask a friend to do that favor for you, you have just added to the inequality problem. You are part of the problem if you do that. Uh, it's a difficult thing to do. When my son asked me if I would help him get an internship at my, publish uh, my publishers, this is a while ago now, I said no. Not helping him. It's a hard conversation to have. Ended up getting it anyway. 
which is great. That's great. <laughs> I should be, I'm pleased. Um, uh, but uh, it really strikes me that this is an apparently trivial thing, but actually internships really count. And in the US, it really strikes me that even those who purport to have relatively progressive kind of liberal views seem to be relaxed about legacy preferences, don't show up to their housing or school board meetings, and happy to kind of give an internship to someone that they know, or indeed get an internship sorted out for their own children, apparently unaware that there are moral issues at stake here. There's a difficult lines to draw. Like when, does, when do you draw the line between being a good parent, wanting best for your kids, and being an opportunity hoarder, rigging the system? We're all going to draw it in different places. But at the very least, let's be aware of what we're doing. Let's be aware of the fact that these are difficult issues. Let's be aware of the fact that sometimes our desire to want the best for ourselves and the best for our children, to have a good retirement and a great house and a good neighborhood and a great education for our kids, doesn't always automatically align with our desire for an inclusive and more equal society. Sometimes those values come into conflict, and then we have to choose. And we very often have to choose at a very local, very individual, in the thick of daily life way. And I hope that if we get that change, that change in norms around some of these issues, actually so that it becomes socially unacceptable to be a NIMBY, in the same way that it's socially unacceptable to be racist or whatever the equivalent is. Um, it's socially unacceptable to rig internships. It's socially unacceptable to use a kind of networks. It's socially unacceptable to go on the wrong side of these arguments. Then if we shift those norms in our own communities as upper middle class Americans who are doing well, then maybe that creates the culture and the, and the space within which we can do some really big things. I'm not saying these small things in and of themselves are enough. I'm saying that we need to change our culture. Because culture precedes politics, and politics always precedes policy. And part of our job, given our position, is to be part of the culture change around all these issues. Let's start with our neighborhoods. Let's start with housing. Let's actually, if we're serious about this, open our institutions, open our hearts, and open our neighborhoods if we want to be serious about the American dream. I'm out of time. Thank you for your attention.